When you first hear those stories where a character is granted three wishes, the first reaction usually is, wouldn't that be cool? Anything you wanted. Three wishes. It gets you thinking. But then as you think, you begin to realize three wishes is awfully few. You look at all the things you want, and you realize if you were going to take advantage of that opportunity, you'd have to really think through your wishes, which ones are most important. You'd have to be willing to put aside a lot of other wishes. Well, that's what death does. It makes you realize that the field of possibilities is limited. You're limited in time, limited in energy. And even before death comes, illness can come. Aging comes. And the range of things you can gain out of life, the desires that you have that could be fulfilled, is pretty limited. This is where determination comes in. When you decide that there's a limited number of things that are really most important to you, and you want to make sure that your other wishes don't get in the way. Think about the Buddha, all those things he could have had in life. And he finally realized what he really most wanted was something who wouldn't die. Now the stories that have been built up around the, the legend of the Buddha tell us about how his family said, oh, that's impossible. His friends told him, it's impossible. Think of all the great people in the past who had to satisfy themselves with sensual pleasures, power, the things of the world. And the, and the legends, the Bodhisattva says, well, in that case, they're not admirable people if they're willing to content themselves with that. And there must have been something of that in the young Bodhisattva's quest when he left home, gave up all those things, all the comforts of home, all the possibilities of power and wealth. He decided what he really wanted more than anything else was something he wouldn't die. Then he sought what was skillful, in other words, the way to get there, what would work. So we have to reflect on our own practice in the same way. There are a lot of things we have to give up, not only in terms of material comforts, but a lot of our cherished ideas. You have to realize that this is one of those paths where you have to take as little luggage as possible. There will be a lot of things you have to give up. But fortunately, the path doesn't save all of its rewards for the end. There are various kinds of clinging that the Buddha talks about. Three of them, he says, you can actually use on the path. Because clinging, of course, means feeding, and you're going to have to feed as you practice. One type of clinging that he says is not to be engaged in that sensuality. And remember what sensuality means. It's your fascination with fantasizing about sensual pleasures. You don't have to give up sensual pleasures altogether, but just this fascination we have with planning for this, planning for that, and they say, no, how about this, how about that? We've got to put that aside. There's no room for that. Which means you have to find your pleasures elsewhere. This is why we hold on to the practice of concentration. That's our alternative pleasure. And we adopt views that are helpful in the past. Here again, there are a lot of things we hold dearly. This is our idea of right, and that's our idea of wrong. But if they get in the way, What's their value? 
there's a certain value they have in the sense that they're your ideas, and they've worked for you in the world. But you have to see that there are a lot of things that you have to give up. And adopt the Buddha's ideas of what's actually right and wrong. Because after all, there is the right path and there's the wrong path. There's so much resistance to this idea here in the West. They try to redefine the word right as being wholesome or healthy or balanced. But the opposite of samma is not unbalanced or unhealthy. It's micha, which means wrong. Some of the wrong things are obviously stated out, stated, set out in the in the text. But there are other things that are not quite so obvious right away, because we don't see their relationship to this issue of right and wrong. But you have to ask yourself: Are you going to hold on to your old rights and wrongs, or give the Buddhas a try? Because he wasn't the sort of person who liked to set up rules just for the fun of setting up rules, or making pronouncements because he liked to make pronouncements. As he said, there's nothing in excess and nothing lacking in the path. So he went to the trouble of saying that something is wrong. Can you take that to heart? When he goes to the trouble of saying something is right, you take that to heart. If he says something is irrelevant to the practice, you say, I'm going to just put that aside. Hold on to the views that he recommends and see where they take you. Because that is his challenge with all these forms of clinging, clinging to pre the practice of concentration, clinging to right view, clinging to the idea that you are capable of doing this. He says, try this. Try it out. See if it works. Of course, to see if it works, you have to be trained to be a good judge of what's working and what's not. I don't know how many people have said, well, I tried meditation and it just didn't work for me. Well, they didn't put in the work. I mean, you have to develop your, your energy, your persistence, stick with it, tividness. And you have to develop your mindfulness and alertness. Refine your discernment. So when you see the results of your actions, you can be a good judge of them. When things are not going well, is it a sign that the path is not going to work at all? Or is it simply that you're not doing something right? You have to go back and check. That willingness to go back and check has saved a lot of people. So remember, your practice is a practice that requires that you look all around. There's one passage where the Buddha says you need a good eye in order to practice. He compares the practitioner to a, a shopkeeper. One of the attributes of a good shopkeeper is that he has a good eye. He knows what kind of items he can buy, buy cheaply, sell for a profit. The Buddha compares this with someone who's able to see the Four Noble Truths. And even though you may not be seeing things in that framework, or they may not, the framework may not be so obvious, but when you see things in terms of what are you doing that's causing suffering, what can you do to stop that? That's when you develop your good eye. The other attributes are that you're astute. In terms of the shopkeeper, you know how to you know how to go about buying something cheap, and you know about how to get other people to buy what you're trying to sell. The astute practitioner is someone who practices the right effort. You notice this again and again, the, the connection between discernment and right effort. Right effort is not just brute effort. 
It's a wise effort. And then finally they said a good shopkeeper has backers. People who deposit money and say, okay, use this to buy and sell, and pay us back with interest. In this case, it's having someone you can go to and ask. When things are not going well in the path, what might be wrong? Or when there's something in the Buddhist teachings you don't understand, how, how do you explain this? In other words, you take advantage of the fact that we are a community. So you want to develop that good eye so you can see what you're doing and what you may be doing wrong, so that you can learn. So be open to the possibility that you're doing things wrong, as long as you haven't reached the end of suffering, okay, that you're still doing something wrong. And learn to take that fact with, with the right attitude. Not get wiped out by it, and not get discouraged. To take it as a challenge, and that you're up for the challenge. Because after all, what would be better than something, a happiness that doesn't die? If you could get just that one wish, as the Buddha said, the other Hardships that go into the practice wouldn't mean anything. You wouldn't see them as hardships at all once you'd attain that goal. It's that worthwhile. So look at the excess baggage you're carrying around and the obstacles you're putting in your path, and see if you can clear them away. and all your excess desires that head off in different directions. Learn how to tame them. Get them so they point in the right direction and are in line with your determination. Because this desire to find something that's deathless, a deathless happiness, really does ennoble life. And even if you can't get there all the way in this lifetime, the fact that you put yourself on the path and made that your goal, that's what makes your life noble as well. <laughs>